So I got you beat there. But that was a great tune. I love Paul Revere and the Raiders. And are we excited? Do we have something to be excited about? We do. Richard Lloyd's on the phone. Let's get to our interview. Yeehaw. Let's do it. Hey, Richard Lloyd, how are you tonight? I'm great, thanks. How are you? I'm doing really good. Uh, doing better now that you've joined us. We appreciate you taking the time tonight. This is uh, Derek, of course, and my co-host Tracy's here. Hey, Richard. Oh, wonderful. Are you calling from... Uh, Derek and Tracy. Tracy, yep, you got it. All right. Are you in Chattanooga, you Tennessee? Yeah, where are you guys? Southern Oregon. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're in Ashland. Looking forward to returning. So when's the last time you were in Southern Oregon, Richard? Oh, I don't know, four or five years ago, probably. Wow. I don't keep track of where I am. <laughs> I'm always here, and it's always now, so I don't need to know what day it is or uh, what day of the month it is or what month it is. Be here now. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm here now. That's nice, man. We we noticed that one of the chapters of your, your book is uh, called Awakening the Kundalini or something close to that. Oh, yeah. The Awakening of Kundalini. I have had a, the classic Kundalini uh, alert. <laughs> right? Yeah. We are so uh, honored to have you yeah. here, you know. I, w I would not suggest the Kundalini Awakening as a... Uh, uh, pastime for anybody. It's quite an endeavor. And it's only for the yeah, serious yeah. people that are really into that, you know? I guess so. That's right. We we had a so quite... We first heard about, uh, I mean, we first heard about yoga when we were uh, very little. I don't know exactly why there was some TV show even in the late 50s about yoga. And I think we, the kids watched it. I remember. Interesting. Black and white, you know, Richard Littleman or something. Oh, wow. Or some woman. I don't, I'm not sure. I think there were a couple of shows. When we started doing the uh, poses, everybody wanted to run away to be a yogi. <laughs> yeah, and that was before, uh, you know, the mid-60s when it kind of caught on with the, uh, you know, the whole um, Hinduism. Oh, yeah, yeah, so that was sure. b before that. Yeah, and then we had the love-ins and the beatings and the smoke-ins and the, and the uh, everything-ins. All the other ins. <laughs> yeah, in New York especially, they're in uh, Central Park, in the sheep meadow, all the sheep would uh, gather. And you would go see Jimi Hendrix quite often. Uh, yes, I would. I enjoyed my rock and roll. Where did Hendrix perform when you used to go see him all the time? Oh, I didn't go see him all the time. I, I saw him four or five times. Uh, Only four or five. I was in New York after the first time, I guess, was in mid-68, August of 68. Wow. And the last time I saw him was uh, probably Woodstock. Oh, Wow. Although I, I left before he finished. Did you? <laughs> I, I didn't think they were very good that day. They Apparently, I found out later, they had been uh, had to stay up all night waiting to go on that dawn. Yeah, because he closed it out, right? Yeah, he was supposed to close it out the night before, but everything ran late. Yeah, and everybody was leaving during his, uh, his set, pretty much. Well, I was one of the people that... Uh, <laughs> I left before most anybody. Had had enough. <laughs> well, I've had enough, and I've seen Jimmy play and be uh, fixing, you know, and uh, this was not bad for me. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I w I've walked out on everybody. Well, you know, I had some listeners. We asked some listeners if they had some questions for you. So most of our questions are based on from your actual fans. Oh, great. Yeah, so yeah, nothing, with... nothing generic, man. Um, no. Let's see. The Marquee Moon album, of course, is, a, is a, just a genius album, and um, we wondered uh, if you knew that this album was going to be as, as influential as it has been over the years. Did you have any idea that was happening? Yes, I, I did. Um, I would think 
that uh, all of us knew something important or significant in our lives anyway was going on and that it would reach people. And, uh, you know, it's gratifying that uh, that our work is uh, still revered. You know, there's one particular fan here in Southern Oregon that's been dying to know how you got your guitar sound or how you recorded the guitars. He was, was wondering uh, how much DI signal uh, that the listener can hear on Marquee Moon, and did you have the guitars mic'd, that kind of thing. Yeah, the guitars were all mic'd. There was no DI guitar. Okay. Or bass. No, no DI anything, really. I don't know anything about that technical stuff. I just know what sounds good, so. <laughs> <laughs> Direct injection, where you take the guitar and you push it into the into the recording desk. Okay, learn something new every day. As See? opposed to having an amplifier and then recording it with a microphone to pick up its uh, vibration. Okay. Yeah. How did so we use real amps? Real amps. A bunch of them. Real amplifiers. Nice. Yeah. Um. How did you decide to go from the raw punk edge of those recordings to the super crisp, clear sound that you finally achieved? Uh, I think that was the sound we were looking for all along. Nice. You know, you have to, you have to walk through some mud to find uh, gold. Yeah, I like that. That's a good metaphor. <laughs> yeah. Um, what were the sessions with Brian Eno like back in 75, 76? As I remember them, they were very uh, quick, and uh, we were only in the studio for like two days. And uh, he, he came in with some bizarre ideas that we all, you know, we just wanted the band recorded. Uh, we didn't want uh, to come up with any super producer tricks. And he was coming up with a lot of, you know, uh, what seemed to be foolish uh, waste of time to, to uh, us. What, what's your... He went, he went on to, to be very, very successful at that. Yeah. With uh, bands from Talking Heads to U2 and continues. You know, he knows uh, a major talent, but, uh, you know, he has his own voice. And he... Uh, it's infused everything he's worked on. And we didn't need a second voice. Ah. Really. <laughs> I mean, that's why we got an engineer who was just becoming... Andy Johns was basically an engineer who was just starting to produce things. Right. And that was an engineer that we that had recorded the greatest guitars in the world. So, obviously, he was a good choice for us. Right. Although oh. he didn't see it at the time. Well, time always tells the truth eventually. Eventually, that's right. Murder will out and so will good record. <laughs> what was your opinion of the Please Kill Me book by Legs McNeil? Well, I spoke to Legs myself. I spoke to him for 12 hours. Wow. He could have written two books just with what I said. And then he took only the... Uh, the prurient interest, uh, juvenile kind of uh, frivolous stuff from everybody. And uh, I thought it was a genius idea. And obviously that, that book is still like the number one of punk selling books, uh, you know, 10 years later, 20 years later, whatever it is. I, I think it's now 20 years. Yeah. That that book's been out. And, uh, I mean, I enjoyed the book. I did. Yeah, it's a it's a fun book. I had, I it's an oral oral history, you know, of a hundred different people and different points of view. It's yeah, terrific for that. I'm just happy you guys had a memory to remember half that stuff. <laughs> well, I tried to, you know, uh, efface my memory, but it's nothing I ever tried worked. <laughs> <laughs> Sort of like when they say, uh, the guy says to Keith Richards, says, uh, you know, how come you always get a, like that amazing guitar sound? And he says, well, I've tried everything, but it always comes out the same. <laughs> well, 
Well, speaking of guitar sounds, how much of the interlocking guitar parts were improvised versus written ahead of time? Not, none of them were really improvised. Ah. They were all worked on for like a year and a half. Oh, wow. So we had a lot of songs hibernate and then disappear that never got recorded. Well, yeah, and, and the way you played, like, two, like, you know, you your guitar sound is kind of unequaled. Um, I mean, it's a formula that works for you. Have you kind yeah. of felt like That's you good. kind of stuck with that same formula throughout your career? Or well, do... I hate to think formulaic, but, you know, that's the way. Well, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean it just kind of like as you have a sound. A staple. And, yeah, an identifiable, a great, you know, an identifiable Absolutely. sound. Absolutely. So. I mean, when I first saw Tom, I saw that he was missing something that I could uh, provide and that uh, I was missing something he could provide. So you put the two of us together and you've got something that's successful. Yeah. Also, you... And that works. It's just plain uh, arithmetic. Two and two make five. <laughs> Especially in rock and roll, two and two make five. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. You uh, auditioned future members of the Ramones for television back in the day. Can I ask which members you guys? I did not. No? I did not. No. Okay. Before I came along, and nobody was suitable. I see. Okay. <laughs> Thank goodness. They looked, they looked, the three of them at one point looked for a guitar player, but couldn't find one. They put an ad in the paper that said, uh, one is guitar talent not necessary and uh, people like Dee Ramona and, and uh, uh, Chris Stein auditioned for them but nobody was right. I so see. I came along and found Tom myself. What was your opinion of the CBGB's movie? Was it accurate or was it not accurate? Oh, it was like, like watching a cartoon, you know? <laughs> I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, you know. Uh, there's no way you could, I mean, you've got documentaries about it, you've got this, I mean, it's just a movie. Yeah. And people got all upset about it, you know, because it was uh, it had animation in it and it was kind of ludicrous, you know, but uh, having been there for the real thing, I just thought it was movie, you know, and let it be. Yeah, just take it at face value. At face value, that's right. And thank and goodness there's no smell o vision. Uh, no smell o vision te technology. <laughs> that's, that's true. You know, it would have been lovely if they'd have recorded every single night there and every single, like Big Brother. Yeah. Big Brother, uh, three year, you know, New Year's Eve party. <laughs> with television. Yeah, with television and other assorted uh, creatures of the night. <laughs> Uh, the Marquee Moon album, is it true that it's still never been out of print? No, it has not. And uh, <laughs> wow. I still get, some, get paid for it. Having done it, I, I'm royal. I get royal. We all do. That's amazing, man. 1977 and never been out of print. That's really amazing. Well, a lot of good records have never been out of print. I guess I've just never thought about it, you know? No, people don't think about that. Uh, they just keep buying them. Well, and now everything's come back around, and and like vinyl is uh especially yeah. yeah, CDs yeah. are becoming more rare, and um, thank God vinyl is is making a big comeback. So, so that's pretty cool. I, yeah, I actually have a couple of things coming out on vinyl from my catalog. Wow, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh. I heard another rumor in 1994 that you were cast by Cynthia Plastercaster. Uh, yep, that's also true. Boy, you've got all the information. <laughs> <laughs> Just all the good have stuff. You seen, have you seen the mold? We have not. We have not no. seen the mold. <laughs> I don't think I ever saw it after that, that evening either. Does she have a display somewhere? Because someday that oh, that's a bucket I list. <laughs> I don't know what she does with them, you know. I always <laughs> thought I'd buy a copy, but uh, it, it was at a price too high. I'm not worth that much. <laughs> it would be a neat museum display, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, do you still teach um, 
Do you still teach other guitar players uh, at your New York City studio these days? I'm not in New York. I'm in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Oh, that's right. Yeah. That's right, Chattanooga. Okay. I teach through Skype, uh, long distance, you know. Oh, do you? You can see and, and hear people. And uh, that seems to work pretty, pretty well. Well, that's pretty cool that you do the Skype thing. Yeah, I think by Skype, uh, you know, not that many students at the moment. I'm kind of busy with other things, but uh, I have a few. Um, I haven't had a chance to read. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I haven't had a chance yeah, to. We're all sorry. What's going on? <laughs> I think there's an echo. I hear a little echo there. Sorry about that. How's it going? Uh, 2017, last year, you put a book out. How's your book doing? Uh, the book's doing great. Uh, just uh, recently came out in Kindle version. There's a hardcover version now and a Kindle version. I read the book, uh, you know, for an audio book read by the author, and that should be coming out any, like any day, any week now. Very cool. And I'm very excited about that, but it took me a thir- uh, 12 and a half hours of reading to read through it. <laughs> and uh, my wife says that at one night, I, and I remember this, because one night I came home after doing a three-hour session of reading the book, and when I went to sleep, I was talking in my sleep out loud, all these uh, stories were coming out of me, and you know, I couldn't stop talking. She was like, "Would you just go to sleep?" And I am asleep, you know. I'm just, uh, <laughs> just running on automatic pilot. Well, I know, I know the reviews that I've read have been have been great, and um, I like how I'm not sure if it was you. Someone said that this new book is a memoir, not an autobiography. Um, well, it, there, there's a subtle difference. Yeah. You can call it whatever you, you can call it an autobiography too, but it's, a memoir is more personal. Absolutely. An autobiography is somewhat, you know, distant. I don't like the sound of autobiography. I don't either. I prefer memoir myself, and I also like the fact that you know it kind of gives you know, it's just instead yeah. of a play-by-play of events, it kind of gives your first-person take and you know the way you remember things. Correct. So yeah, it's also more French. <laughs> what do you have going on right now? What um, I know you just said uh, you had some oh, I, stuff I, maybe released on vinyl I, coming up. Yeah, I got some vinyl coming out on the record store day, but I can't talk about it because they like to announce it themselves. Right on. So we wait for them to announce it, and that's in April. But I also have a new tour of the North East. For a couple of weeks in April. Boo, we're in the um, Northwest. <laughs> yeah, I know. The Northwest. I'm, well, we're thinking about that for maybe the fall of this year. Oh, that'd be awesome. But, I, but I've tried to get to the, get over the, uh, what is it, the Continental Divide before the last couple of years. I, it just hasn't happened. So i got to put a string of dates together to make it work. We'll be looking for that. Uh, book reading, you know, we can... If we can do the, the two together, I usually try to combine them. I just did three book readings uh, in the New York area that went very, very well. Well, yeah, maybe Powell's, the big, gigantic yeah. Portland uh, bookstore oh, that's sure. that you can get yeah, lost I, in. <laughs> yeah, they, they would like something like this. That's the place to have it. Absolutely. They wouldn't have a concert in there. No. One of the one of the book signings that uh, we did play it was the uh, Jimmy Mastro and Jimmy Cinzio that played on with Alchemy, or uh, played on on Alchemy, my first solo record. Yeah, and that was a tremendous amount of fun. I bet Tony Shanahan played bass though because Fred was upstate. Fred Smith has played on Alchemy as well. Nice. So Tony Shanahan from Patty Smith band played bass. Such a good one. Great... Terrifically. But nobody recorded it. I have a little recorder. I forgot to turn it on. Oh, oh no. Oh. <laughs> oh. Well, yeah. There goes history. <laughs> Temporal. It just floats away. Totally. Well, Richard, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to, you know, talk to uh, us over here in Ashland, Oregon, and maybe we could have you back on if you end up doing the fall tour out this way or something. Absolutely. I appreciate your uh, interest and your 
afternoon. For sure. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, we just, the art. we just played a television uh, song right before we spoke to you, and uh, we uh, regularly try to do that on the Church of Rock, so. Yeah. Church of Rock. It's a, it's a religion. Rock is rolling. You know how many people go into become preachers and all of that, like Al Green and Little, Little Richard. Richard. yeah. <laughs> Rock and roll and religion are like very, very together. Hey, they both, uh, they both move the only, spirit. Only religion in the sense of this Latin meaning to, to reconnect. That's right. Religare from the ligature, where you get ligature or ligament. Interesting. Reattach. <laughs> well, thanks. Yeah, me too, man. And thanks for being on the Church of Rock, Richard Lloyd. We really appreciate your time, man. Me too. And your music. Okay. Okay, much love, man. Until later, then. Yeah. We'll catch you next time. You will. Okay. Bye-bye now. Have a good night. You too. All right, bye-bye.